Well, it is great to worship together and to sing his praises and to celebrate those taking a step of baptism. This is also Veterans Day weekend, and so to all of the uh, veterans, those who have served in our armed forces, we're grateful for you. We want to acknowledge you and say thank you for your service, and we uh, appreciate the sacrifices you made. And while we pray for peace in our world and the conflict that's happening all around, we also recognize that sometimes peace comes at a cost, and that's especially true when it comes to our faith our faith in Christ. Our peace with God was won by the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Let's bow and acknowledge him before we open his word. Father, once again, we just say thank you for what you're doing in our lives, in our church family, in our individual lives. Thank you for these precious lives taking the step of baptism that encourages our faith. Might we all live uh, for your glory and not our own. Now open our eyes and our minds to your word. We pray it in your name. Amen. Uh, several years ago, uh, my wife and I, uh, this is set out with a financial planner. We were way overdue in doing this. Some of you, uh, this may be your business or maybe you, you regularly do this, but it had been a long time for us. Uh, well, this is the first time actually. So we sat down and they asked us questions. You've probably been through this, right? What age do you think you'll retire? And I was like, retire? Do pastors retire? Maybe never? I don't know, right? Well, what do you wanna, where do you want to live? What's your standard of living? What are your goals? What's important to you? They ask a whole series of questions about our plans, our dreams, our ideas for our future. To set a plan and then sort of back up from there. Now, for some of you, that's no, you've done that many times, or, or maybe you do it as a profession. It was kind of new for me to think that way. I'd never thought about most of those questions in terms of uh, what they were asking us. It reminded me of the time I went golfing with a guy who was new to our church, getting to know him, took me golfing, and, we're, and he, he's really good. I am bad, but I, I'm happy to go if he pays. So we went golfing. Anyway, and getting to know each other and talking as we played. And uh, he was telling me, he was, I'm on a, I got a 10-year plan for my life, Pastor Jeff. 10 years. Well, tell me about it. Well, he laid out what he was going to be making by what year, where he'd be in his career, what advancement, where they, what house they would live in, and like where his kids would be at that stage. It was all mapped out with metrics and, and dates, roughly in his 10-year plan. Somewhere around in the, the second nine, the back nine, I asked him, I don't remember what hole, I asked him, hey, uh, can I ask you a question about your 10-year plan? He said, yeah, yeah. I said, what do you think God thinks of your 10-year plan? He stopped, turned and looked at me and went, well, I hope he likes it kind of grinned at me and then hit his tee shot. I thought about that uh, often. What does God think of our plans? That's uh, really the heart of what we're going to look at now as we continue our series, just a couple of weeks left in our study of the book of James. James' letter to these Christian churches, uh, these Jewish believers converted to faith in Jesus about what it means to put their faith into action. Faith works is the title of our series. How does our faith work itself out in our lives? Um, and I, I'll admit, when my friend mentioned that, uh, his 10-year plan, I was a little bit envious. Like, oh, he's really clear about the direction of his life. But we may not all, not all have a 10-year plan, but I'll bet all of you have ideas about your future. Plans, hopes, dreams, things you're working toward. You ever stop to think, what does God think of them? You ever stop to ask him? Well, let's look at James chapter 4, verses 13 through 17, the end of James 4 in our, in our series. Come now. You who say, today or tomorrow, we'll go into such and such a town and spend a year there, trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. This passage through chapter 5, verse 12, is really one part of a central theme, all framed around finances and economics. Those who have it and think it's their identity and their future security, those who use it to oppress others, those who are oppressed by others and lack it. Rich or poor, money can become a god to us and and a barrier to us. Nothing impacts how we think about our security, our comfort, our identity, and our future like our finances. That's why Jesus talked about it so much. Nothing has greater impact, in our culture especially, on how you think about who you are and where you're headed than what you have or don't have. This, uh, this question he asks here, I want to focus in on this question here. He asks a profound question, which I think is really relevant for us. What is your life? I think part of the issue that our planning gets in our way is we have a fundamental misunderstanding of what our life is. What is your life? This is the question I want us to focus on. 
James asks a deeply profound question, and he asks it in response to those who are making plans, who are talking about what they're going to do today, tomorrow, next month, next year, 10 years, where they're going to be and how they're going to get there. We go about our lives making our plans. I do this even with the church. We've got plans, got dreams and visions, what God will do and how we're going to get there without really acknowledging I'm not in control of that. I cannot actually make that happen, and neither can you. It's a question worth pondering, and one James is going to help us answer. Look at verse 14 of chapter 4 one more time. Right in this verse, James answers the question for us about what is your life with three things. We're going to talk about them in succession. Three realities that are often, I think, in our culture, difficult. People don't really want to face these. Not really. We might say them, but we don't live as if they are true. And you'll see them in a couple statements here. You do not know what tomorrow will bring. You are a mist, appears for a little while, a little time then vanishes. These three statements will bring us to an understanding of what our life is according to the scriptures. First, life is short. Life is short. You might say, yes, yes, I know that, I get that, but do you live like it's true? Like this life is brief. It's, it's, you don't have tomorrow guaranteed. We don't think that way. I don't. I don't live this day and tomorrow and the next day in light of the fact that I might not get another one. Most of us assume next week, next month, next year is guaranteed. You are a mist, a vapor. Our lives on this earth are brief. Some of you know that. You faced it in your own life with a diagnosis or having an experience that brought you face to face with your mortality, loss of someone you love. Look at what the psalmist says and what Job says, Psalm 144, verse 4. Man is like a breath. It's going to be cold soon, right? James says mist, or sometimes translated vapor. When you get up early in the morning, even now, early in the morning, you walk outside, what happens to your breath? Can you see it? Can you? Yes. How long does it last? Whew, gone. That's the image he's given us. Your life on this earth. Should you live 50, 60, 70, 80, 20 years, whatever the time is, is like whew, gone, like a breath. His days are like a passing shadow. For we are but of yesterday and know nothing, for our days on earth are a shadow. Over and over again, the scripture testifies to this. Though we don't like to admit it, we don't think of it, our life is short. Even the psalmist in Psalm 90 says, your, your years on this earth are 70 80 if you're lucky, maybe 90. Like if, if you live a long time. My dog, Ivy, just turned 15. She's in her 16th year, which in dog years is like 110. I don't know what, if you, what, I don't know if, if, if one year is seven years to a human being, then what is like a month? I don't know. I don't know the calculations, but she's old, really old. And she's like Benjamin Button of dogs. She's aging backwards. She will not die. Not that I want her to. Kind of. I don't really. I mean, I love Ivy, but it's like, it's how long, oh Lord? You know, anyway. So sometimes when I come, I know some of you like, oh, that's cruel. But you don't know her the way I know her. So, sometimes, sometimes when I complain about Ivy, my wife is like, how would you like it when you're 107 if I treat you this way? I'm like, I will not be here at 107. At least I hope not. And the psalmist tells us in Psalm 90, verse 12, the point of facing your, the brevity of your life, your own mortality is what? Teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. The whole point of recognizing your life is short is not to make you fearful or anxious, but so that you see your life accurately and gain a heart of wisdom. So first, life is short. Second, life is fragile. It's fragile. It appears for a little while, and then it vanishes. Meaning even though it's short, it's not even the shortness of it isn't guaranteed. You don't get a set number, though brief, of days of security and strength, and comfort, and ease. Not, most of us don't recognize this when we're young. We live as if we're invincible. I went on a, a fly fishing trip with some pastors to Montana several, a couple years ago. And I, I, I was pe past 50. I, I still am, by the way. Anyway, <laughs> we, the, we were fishing, and we went on this, uh, this uh, pontoon ride on the, the Bighorn River Canyon. Massive cliffs, beautiful God's creation, and one of the cliffs that you can jump off, and the guide says, hey, let's go do it. The guides are all in their 20s. They live in the woods. They're made of bark. Anyway, and he runs up there, like, come on, who's going? And most of us pastors are like, uh, uh, well, I, I enjoy a challenge. 
And so I went up there and I thought I would try it. And then once you get up there, you, I can't walk down. But now I, I did not have the courage I had when I was younger, standing up there. I started to shake. And I'm like, ah, I'm not as flexible. I'm not as limber. I'm, anyway, the point is I jumped off. It was ice cold and I paid for it the rest of the week. It hurt, but I didn't, I didn't admit that until now. We live as if we're not going to be injured or hurt or, but our life is fragile. And most of you know that. You've experienced it. Somebody young and strong cut down, we say, in the prime of their life. A diagnosis comes. The fragility of our life is right in our, we're all one moment away from facing that. Psalm 39, verses four through five puts it this way. O Lord, make me to know my end and what is the measure of my days. Let me know how fleeting I am. Behold, you've made my days a few handbreadths, and my lifetime is as nothing before you. Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath. Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verse 12. For who knows what is good for a man while he lives the few days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow? Who can tell what will be after him under the sun? Let me know how fleeting I am. Why? This is what James is going to teach us. So I see my life accurately. So I live accordingly. So life is short. Life is fragile. The third thing, life is uncertain. You do not know what tomorrow will bring, he says. You do not know. You do, turn to your neighbor and say, you do not know. <laughs> and some of you are like, I've been telling him that for years. right? You, know, right there. you don't know. You don't actually know what tomorrow will bring. We think we do. But you don't. This is a direct response to those who are making plans, who are planning out their lives. Today, and then tomorrow, and next month, we're going to go here, we're going to do this, we're going to earn this much. If we invest here, this will turn out this way. But you don't know. Not really. Now, James is not against planning or making a profit. The Bible nowhere says it's wrong to plan and it's wrong to earn. It says the opposite. The point is not that they plan and that they make a profit off their planning. The point is what? They do all of this with no sense of their own mortality and no acknowledgement of God's sovereignty. As if they're in control of it. As if it's a guarantee. This, he says, is boasting. It doesn't mean you're bragging. It, it means spiritual pride. Living as if you're in control, not God. Proverbs 16, verse 9 says, In their hearts men make their plans, but it's God who determines their steps. How often do we even stop to consider the will of God in all of our planning? Our family plans, our financial plans, our future plans. And asking God to bless our plans when we have not involved him in them from the beginning, that's the height of arrogance, isn't it? Lord, bless my plans. And like we never asked him to begin with. Like, put your, put your stamp on it so I feel good, but they're my plans. This is functional atheism, if you think about it. I mean, I say I believe in God, and I say that I believe that God is sovereign. He's in total control. He sees all, knows all. Nothing is outside of his sovereign will and control. I say that. I believe that. But I don't live like that's true. I live functionally like he's not. Functional atheism. While I come in here and I worship. I go home and I plan like it's up to me. Look at verse 15, James chapter four, verse 15. James tells us, what should we do then? Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will, what does he say? Live and do this or that. Notice what James begins. He doesn't begins with your plans. He says, if the Lord wills, you'll get up tomorrow. If the Lord wills, you'll get home today. Now, I'm not trying to be morbid or scary. I'm just saying your whole life, my whole life is in the hands of a sovereign God. Everything, everything you achieve or accomplish, every failure, every success, every dream, every plan, every breath. You ever wonder why we sing songs about breath? You are the air we breathe. I once met a guy who said, like, what does that even mean? He's new to Christianity. It's an acknowledgement that everything about your life, including the fact that you're living, is a gift of God and in his hands. The Latin phrase for this, if the Lord wills, is Deo Valente. Christians in the Roman world used to say Deo Valente, the Lord willing. Sign their letters, D period, V period. 
Now, let me give you uh, a couple of things James is not saying when he says, instead you must say, if the Lord wills, we'll live and do this or that. Number one, this is not fatalism. It doesn't mean, uh, uh, well, well, God's already determined it. God's already decided, so what's the point of even planning? It's all in his hands. It's not determinism. It doesn't mean we sit back passively and do nothing because God's already decided. That's not what James is saying. That's not what the scripture testifies to. The second thing is, it's not a formula. I hear Christians who will use this phrase, well, Lord willing, as if just saying those words, magic words, makes, makes everything okay, right? Lord willing, I will do whatever I want. That's not what James is saying. It's not words you just speak over your own personal selfish plans. James is describing a whole different way to live, an entirely different way to think about your life. Remember our question? What is your life? It's short. It's uncertain. It's fragile. And in light of that, how should you live? Our world tells us we're going to be around for a long time, maybe forever. We have whole industries dedicated to increasing our security and our comfort and prolonging our life. I'm not sure that it's good that we prolong our lives indefinitely. I'm not sure that always works out for the best. But even still, it's, we're in God's hands. Our culture also tells us that you're in control of your life. You can shape it. I see people post things like, I love this life we're building together. And I understand that to a degree we are. But maybe the better thing for us as Christ followers is not to say that, but to say, I love this life God has blessed us with, that we get to live faithfully under his sovereign care in. Not what I'm doing, but what he's doing. It's a lie that you're going to be around forever. And it's not true that you're in control of your life. Your life is not in your hands. It's in God's. And to live as if that's true. Some of you might be thinking, well, that makes me a little nervous. I mean, the fact that my life is short and fragile and uncertain, I'm uncomfortable with that. I don't like that. I would much prefer to, to know that I can control something. Any control freaks in here? Right? Some of you should poke somebody next to you. Need to have control, or at least it's a myth that we control really much of anything except for our own attitudes and actions and reactions. But there's great freedom in this, friends. There is great freedom in knowing these things because it throws us into the, back into the hands of the God who is eternal and sovereign in whose care we actually rest. We just forget that. Let me put it to you this way. Here's, if you want to jot this down or take a picture of it, this is our response. Because our lives are so short, fragile, and uncertain, the only sane response is to live in humble submission to God in obedience to his will. Like if we saw it right, if we knew how to answer the question, what is your life, accurately, this is how we would live. Submission to God and obedience to his will. Uh, humility, by the way, is the link between chapter 4 and chapter 5 of James. Remember in chapter, earlier in chapter 4, last week, if you were uh, paying attention, Blake walked us through this. And by the way, can I just pause and say praise God for our pastoral residency and for young preachers like Blake Lawson. We are so blessed of our campus pastors and the preachers on our staff. He did a fantastic job. If you missed it, go back and listen to it. He talked to us about this. The, the humility is the posture that we receive God's grace to deal with conflicts and divisions. It's also the posture we receive God's grace to make our plans in the light of his sovereignty. Humility, that's the link. The word submission is a Greek word, hupotasso. It's fun to say, but here's what it means. To order under, it's a military term. To place yourself under authority. To, to order your life underneath the authority of the one who's actually in control. We, in this last phrase, obedience to his will. How many of you have ever struggled to know the will of God in your life? Anybody? Show of hands. How many think you always exactly know what God's will is in every situation? Maybe a couple of you? Most of us struggle with this, and we think of it like, like it's the center of a bullseye, right? Like if I could just know what God's will is, if I could just get it right, and if I could hit the target, then my life would be good. Or we think of God as like a cosmic game show host. Right behind door number one, my perfect will for your life. Door number two, eh, you still get to heaven, but it's not nearly as good as door number one. Door number three, ooh, I hope you don't choose that. That's bad. But we don't know, and God's up in heaven going, let's see what these poor suckers choose, right? That's not, God, that's not how God's will works. God's will is not a mystery that he's waiting to see if you're smart enough to figure out. And when I ask the question, if you'd like to know God's will, most of you are thinking in terms of where should I go to school? Who should I marry? What job should I take? Where should I live? Like, 
the temporal circumstances of your decision making on earth. I do believe God's will applies to those things. But nowhere can you look in the Bible and say, well, this is the street I should live on. Right? This is the name of the person I should marry. This is the job I should take. You find principles by which you make those decisions. But I'm going to give you five New Testament scriptures that will walk you through what God's will is for your life. That if you live according to them, it changes everything. It changes everything. Because God's not coy or mysterious about his will. He's crystal clear. We're just not paying attention, most of us, most of the time. Look at what it says. 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 through 5. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. What is God's desire? What's God's desire, friends? That you'd be saved we just celebrated in baptism. And come to the knowledge of God in Christ Jesus. For there's one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus. Let's start here. We can't even have the conversation about God's will until we talk about your relationship with God in Christ. This means the first step in knowing God's will is to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, for your eternal destination, and for the lordship of your life right now. Not knowing about God, not having a respect of God, about God from a distance, not believing generally that God exists and trying to be a good person, but turning over your life to him, getting on your knees and crying out to God for forgiveness and grace and mercy, receiving it through the blood on the cross, knowing you're forgiven and free, finding your identity in Christ. That's God's will for you. It starts there. Your life is so, you might think, well, I'll get that together. Your life is so short. Your life is so brief, so fragile. You don't have tomorrow promised. Start there now. One of the great, every time I get up to preach at our campuses, I think about there are so many people coming to our services who believe in God, go to church, moral people, I should be spiritual, I like the way this church is. But you haven't turned over your life, laid it down, said, God, forgive me in Christ. Come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. That's God's will. It's his deep desire for you. Number two, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. For this is the will of God. Our ears should perk up. Your sanctification. That's a fun churchy word. This means the process of you, once you trust in Jesus, becoming more like him. That when you trust in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, you become his and he begins to change you, sanctify you, transform you, conform you to the image of his son. Your character being molded into alignment with the will of God, the word of God, and the image of his son Jesus. I think we, we want to talk about circumstances. God wants to talk about our character, our heart. We want to talk about what's God's will for where I should live. And God's saying, let's talk about this, this unforgiveness, this anger, this bitterness. Second or third, 1 Thessalonians 5.18. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. It does not say give thanks for all circumstances, but in all circumstances. That means in every circumstance of your life, even the awful ones, even the ones you wish never came to you, you can give thanks to God in Christ Jesus for what he's done for you, that your, your future is secure. My good friend used to say, and I, I love this, I wrote it down on the inside cover of my Bible, that in Christ, my past is redeemed, my present makes sense, and my future is secure. I love that. Nothing about my past defines me, Christ has forgiven it. My present is in his hands, it makes sense because he's holding it, and I know where I'm headed. And I can give thanks for that in every circumstance. Think about that. Just those three things. Repent of your sin, trust in Jesus Christ, become his, God's will for you. Let him change you, sanctify you in, in the image of his son. And give thanks to God for that as long as he gives you breath. That's God's will for you. Number four, Ephesians chapter five, verses 15 through 17. Look carefully then at how you walk. The word walk doesn't mean like, you ever see Monty Python, the, the office of silly walks? It doesn't mean how do you walk. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that. It means how you live. Walk means you, the quality of your life. Walking out your daily activities. That's what he's talking about. 
Not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. How many of you have heard something about, you know, all these wars and all the uncertainty in the world? This must be the end. These days are evil. Anybody think that, right? Well, James was writing that over 2,000 years ago. It's always been true. The world is broken, full of uncertainty. Live wisely according to the will and the word of God. So repent of sin and trust in Jesus. Let him begin to change you from the inside out. Give thanks to him constantly for who he is and what he's done. And live your life in alignment with his will and his word. That's God's will for you. Not sitting around trying to solve it, figure it out, hit the center of the bullseye, but do what he's called you to do. Number five, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 15. For this is the will of God that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. What does he mean? The way that you live in the world, the first four verses, trusting in Christ, being changed into the image of his son, giving thanks in all circumstances, living with biblical wisdom, is a witness to the world. It's your best witness. It's the best way you testify to who Jesus is. And there's no argument against it. People can argue, yeah, what about Jonah? Well, what about, you know, what about all the, we can get into, like, I don't believe this, or I don't believe that, I don't have scientific evidence, and there's good arguments, and I love to debate those things. But your best witness in the world is not your argument, it's your life. It's the quality and character of your life lived out humbly, faithfully. That puts to silence people. There's no argument against that. Like the blind man, blind, who, who, uh, who was healed by Jesus, and the religious leaders interrogate him, who sinned? Right? Is this man a sinner? And he goes, ah, that's above my pay grade. I don't know. All I know is I was blind, and now I can see. Like that scene in The Chosen, right? All I can tell you is I was one way, and now I'm another. And the thing that happened in between is Jesus. That's what he's saying. Live your life the way we just described, and there's no argument against that. It's a great witness in the world. Now, I know some of you are still thinking, okay, yeah, but I have a decision to make. What's God's will about my business? What's God's will about this situation and this relationship? Here's what Jesus has to say about all the things that plague us related to tomorrow. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Isn't that a great verse? Do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Isn't that true? You've got enough to do today without living in anxiety about tomorrow. Seek first the kingdom of God. How? We just were describing how. Repent of your sin and trust in Jesus Christ. Make him Lord and Savior of your life. Humbly submit to him. Let him begin the process by his spirit of changing you, transforming you, sanctifying you. Give thanks to him every day that he gives you breath, every day of your life, that he is good and he loves you and your identity is in him. Learn wisdom from his word and walk in it. And this will be the visible testimony of your life in the world. Do that. That is seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. Do those things. If I, I, am, I don't always do this well, but when you, well, I can tell you from experience, when I do that, not perfectly, but when I'm doing those things, those five things, I'm not stressed. I'm not worried. I see truth more clearly. This, God is, I, I understand his voice. I hear him. His word comes alive to me. I want to walk in truth. When I'm not doing those things, then I'm paralyzed by decisions. What's your will? I, I don't know. This is the center of the bullseye, friends. So James says, come on now, you who make your plans. He's talking to contemporary American Christians. Come on, you who have your dreams and your visions and your plans for your future. Let's talk together. What is your life? What is your life? It's gone tomorrow. It's only here a little while. It's so uncertain and fragile. Don't be afraid of that. Don't be filled up with anxiety about that. Don't be terrified or paralyzed by that. But recognize your life is not in your hands. It's in his so put it there. Let's put ourselves there. And let's walk in wisdom and in grace and in freedom. This is what James is saying. And then that last part, 
If you know what you ought to do, you don't do it. Right? That last little part, did you catch that? It is sin. This is called the sin of omission. There's sins of commission, things you do. I'm pretty good as a pastor at avoiding the big ones. Not perfect, but I avoid, I haven't murdered. You know, I don't do the big ones. I'm pretty good at avoiding the big sins you're not supposed to do. But if I'm honest, this is a struggle for me. There are many times I know the right thing to do and I don't do it. I feel the nudge of God. I feel the spirit prompting me and I don't do that. I don't like to think that's sin. That's just, you know, ah, I'm getting better. James says, now that you know what your life is, now that you know what his will is, do it. Do it. How many of you still want to know what God's will is? It's good. He has shown you, O oh man and a woman, what is good and what the Lord requires of you. To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk, live humbly with your God. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I want to begin by praying with and for anyone here who knows about you and believes generally that you exist, but has never turned over their life to you, has never repented of sin and trusted in your forgiveness, has never acknowledged the, the frailty of their life, the brevity of it. If that's you, pray with me. Lord Jesus, I acknowledge that I am in desperate need of your forgiveness and your grace. I have no control over my life and I place it in your hands. Forgive me, Lord, and take control. And for those of us who have done that and believe that, but struggle to live as if that's true, help us to place once again our lives in your sovereign hands, for that's where they are all along. We thank you that you help us to see reality, even though it's unsettling, so that we can see clearly who you are and know your will and do it. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you, that you live perfectly on this earth, doing the Father's will, becoming obedient all the way to the cross for our sake and for our salvation. We pray this in your name. Amen.